If listening to Unforgotten has inspired you to create your own podcast, you're in luck. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can make your own podcast and share it with the world. And the Spotify platform makes it super easy to get started. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter where you are when an idea hits, you're ready to start recording. Spotify for Podcasters makes it easy to distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Plus, you can do video podcasts and engage with fans through Q&A and polls. You can even earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's free. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters and sign up for your free account to start recording and sharing your podcast with the world. Hey everyone, this is Sellers. And this is Stormy. And And this this is is Unforgotten. Unforgotten. Where each episode will highlight unsolved missing, murdered, and suspicious death cases in Alabama in order to raise awareness and hopefully obtain some answers for victims and their families. Please remember that any individual referenced in the podcast should be considered innocent until found guilty in a court of law, and any opinions or views expressed in the podcast are solely those of participants. Listener discretion is advised as some of the content discussed in the podcast may contain violence or graphic descriptions and may not be suitable for all audiences. Be sure to join our Unforgotten Patreon channel today to gain exclusive benefits, including early access to ad-free episodes and bonus content. By subscribing, you'll also be supporting the efforts of ACCA in assisting families in raising awareness for Alabama cold cases. Hey guys, and welcome back. Stormy, you did a really good job on that last episode. Hey, it's, it's, you know, it's hard when you have such, you know, emotional and difficult content. You yeah. Gotta, you don't want to overdo it. I don't know. I think it turned out pretty good. I think it turned out really good. Not to toot our own horn or anything, but <laughs> I thought it turned out really good. Yeah. Well, you did some good writing there too, so... Thank you, thank you. It's mm-hmm. getting better. It's getting it better. is, yeah. Um, yeah. I, it's taken a little while to kind of get in the flow of like right. writing in a manner that I guess is not. It's hard to write it in a conversative way, but also like you don't want to just put bullet points in there because sometimes you want to make sure that what you're trying to convey, so you don't forget anything. I guess basically, you right. have all this information that's in there, especially like. We talk about so much stuff when we aren't on the air. No, us. <laughs> I've got like five <laughs> notebooks over here. And it's like, oh, my gosh. And you try to like compile it or condense it down mm-hmm. into like these bullet points. And you're like, yeah, but there was a point to this. What was my point to this? But you don't want to just read it off of there. And sometimes that gets really hard. Yeah. Yep, yep. So I think like going from the beginning of this year to now, like it's been a pretty big improvement, I think. I think it has too. You know, it only took us a year, but <laughs> yeah, okay. and hopefully it'll just still, you know, just keep getting better, keep yep. getting better. Although I did listen to a couple of other podcasts today while I was sitting in the hunting stand. <laughs> Probably should have, you know, actually been listening for while I was out there, but you know, huh. <laughs> but I'm like, man, I feel like for the two of us doing this, we're doing a really good job. I don't feel like we're really, you know, below where some of these other really top podcasts are. I feel like we sound really well. I, I agree, maybe that's, some bi- maybe that's some bias coming out. Yeah, you know, a little bit. But maybe. I think overall, I think we have a pretty good sound, you know? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Always room for improvement, but we're getting there. We're getting there. You kind of look back and you think, I remember what we did when we first started. And even <laughs> though... Even though, you know, I think we did a pretty good job when we first started, we were learning a lot, you know, so, and we kind of changed things up quite a bit at the beginning. Oh my gosh, it did t- kind of take a, a turn from what we started with. Um, yeah, and I think it went yeah. in a really, 
good direction. I like where we ended up at. Right. Um, and it's a level of comfort, too. Mm-hmm. It's really it kind of nerve wracking. That kind of look. It is. Yeah. And I kind of look at, you know, there's a lot of podcasts like that are just starting to come out mm-hmm. again. And I don't know if that's because it's like the end of the year and people are kind of gearing up for the first of the year and they think that people have a lot of time over the holidays to listen yeah. or I don't know. It seems odd that we all listen have a bunch of them either starting or going oh, to be starting. Are we, on, but, are we backwards? We, huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're kind of opposite, but hey, we're ahead of the game, right? Uh, or we're just <laughs> being true to ourselves, running everything backwards. Well, you know. You know, flying by the seat of our pants. It, t- it takes a lot of work. We've recorded over 2,000 minutes this year. Oh, and that's just crazy. If you think about listening every week, it doesn't, it's a lot because it's not just 2,000 minutes has been recorded. No. <laughs> it's definitely a lot more. Like some of the, Y'all knew how much I cut. Oh my gosh. Yes. So a lot goes into it, but mm. I wouldn't change it. No. I like, I like it. it. I like, I think the reason that the podcast part has become one of my favorite things about the ACCA is that it provides the families the opportunity to speak and tell their story. Absolutely. And it's different than like on social media because they can post and things, but you know, that gets kind of mundane. Everybody does yeah. it, you know, so. And the, you can only fit so much information on one of the case cards that we share and that's great for providing an overall summary and like getting that out there in general and just kind of reminding people and refreshing everybody's mind. But this avenue gives us the ability to kind of expand on that and provide more information. And I don't know how many times we've gotten comments about it. I didn't even know that until, you know, I listened to it. And yeah. Yeah. so I think it's a great avenue to have to kind of expand on that. And because there are some of the families that we talk to, they haven't had anybody ask them about these cases in years. Right. And as important as the goals and efforts were to begin with, it completely changes the outlook on that. We've always reiterated this throughout the podcast and throughout social media and everywhere that these families really are like family to us. And They'll never just be a story. They'll never just be somebody out there, a statistic or any of that stuff. Never will be. 2023 has been a It good has year. been. Everything has grown. The page has grown. Um, the social media page has grown. We've got a lot of traffic coming through. I get notifications from the website saying your stats are booming. Um, yeah. Probably means I need yep. to get those cards moved over a little bit faster. Um <laughs> Actually, George James's mom, Tillis, is going to start blogging for us over on the website. I'm pretty excited about that. I'm so excited about that. Yay, Tillis. Um, oh, for those who haven't seen it, the merch store is back up. So yes, yes. Go I'm so excited about and that. Some, and watch for some uh, a little bit different uh, merchandise. Yes, there's there. Just kind of keep your eyes out. A couple new little designs over there. Just great amounts of thank yous to everybody out there. I think next year is going to be a really good year. I think we're going to be talking to more families. I know that for a while we were not tentative about talking to families, maybe a little bit, just because we were new at what we were doing and weren't sure how people would take it. But I think we got into the swing of things, and I think it's going to be really helpful for families if we're able to at least connect with them, if not you know, talk with them conversationally. I agree. We've got a couple already lined up to work on over the mm-hmm. holidays. So um, I'm excited about that and the cases yeah. that are coming up. So I think it's going to be. Yep. And just a reminder that we will have CJ Wilkinson's third episode after the yes. break. So look forward to that. Yeah. I, I can't wait to share the rest of it. I know. I, I can't wait either. Just like Stormy said, thank you to everybody who has tuned in each week. Um, Thank you to everybody who has left ratings and reviews because that helps boost it up to make sure that a broader audience has the opportunity to hear these stories and hear from the families. And it gives a better chance 
that somebody with information will hear the episode, hear the families, hear what's going on, and potentially come forward. You know, ultimately, that is what we would love to see happen with everything that we're doing, you know, is to get the family's answers. Yep. Thank you to everybody who shared everywhere. Absolutely. Yep. Well, with that being the last episode, I thought, well, you know, it's the end of the year. It's not going to be that long, but actually there's quite a few. And that always makes me sad to know that. Um, but we're going to share all of these cases. And uh, if you remember any information about it, please reach out. We'll have the contact information for each case, as always, in the description. Please keep their names out there and support the families so they can find a resolution for the lost ones. Christopher Halfley. 68-year-old Christopher Halfley of Wetumpka, Alabama, appears to have left his home in the 400 block of Butler Lake Road in northern Elmore County on foot on December 12, 2021. Christopher is known to walk everywhere he goes though he's also been known to hitch a ride at times. It's been two years since Christopher was last seen. Physically, at the time he left, Christopher was in good health. However, he was in the early onset stages of Alzheimer's. His family was very concerned about impaired judgment as the year prior, he had become disoriented while attempting to drive to a friend's in Atlanta. Christopher is a white male, age 70, with gray hair and blue eyes. He is approximately six feet tall and 190 pounds. When he left home, he was wearing blue jeans with a button-down polo-style shirt of an unknown color. He has a rose tattoo on his inner left calf. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Christopher Halfley, please contact the Elmore County Sheriff's Office at 334-567-5546. Michael Charles Richard. On December 30th, 2021, Around 4 a.m., 46-year-old Michael Richard concluded his shift at the local Amazon Fulfillment Center and made a stop at Jack's Restaurant, presumably to get something to eat. Afterward, he drove to the abandoned and mostly burned down Old Nights Inn Motel in Bessemer, where he intended to spend the night. Michael was temporarily using a yellow Hyundai Sonata loaned by the dealership while his own vehicle was being repaired. Approximately 12 hours later, at around 4.30 p.m., Michael was discovered shot to death inside the Hyundai. His wallet was missing, but his phone and Amazon employee ID remained inside the vehicle. According to his family's interview with AL.com, he was highly intelligent but struggled with structure and social details. Despite these challenges, he eventually obtained his GED and a network engineering degree from Virginia College. Later, Michael met a woman online who moved to Alabama to live with him, and he obtained a job in packaging at Amazon. He aspired to transition into the IT department there. During this time, he amassed a significant following on his TikTok channel called Alone in the Dark, where he live-streamed his visits to various places at night. His brother revealed that Michael felt very lonely but found solace in assuming different personas on the social media platform and thrived on the attention that he received. Michael's family asserted that he was against the use of drugs and alcohol and had no history of using either. He also frequently provided food, blankets, and clothes to vagrants in and around the Old Night's Inn, despite warnings from his family and the Bessemer PD that he really shouldn't be there. Subsequently, Michael and his girlfriend broke up, and his family later discovered that his apartment lease had expired, though they were uncertain of exactly when that happened. Due to the expired lease, Michael started living in his car, which led him to the Old Knights Inn on the morning of December 30th. In the last two years, few tips had been received on Michael's case. Crime Stoppers has offered a reward of up to $10,000 in addition to a $5,000 reward from his family for any information that could lead to the arrest of the person or persons responsible for Michael's death. We covered Michael's case in episode 22, and for more information, I suggest you have a listen. If you have any information at all regarding Michael's senseless death, please contact Bessemer PD at 205-425-2411 
their tip line at 205-428-3541, Crime Stoppers at 205-254-7777, or you can submit an anonymous tip on their website. Summer Lachey Busby 23-year-old Summer Busby from Jasper, Alabama, left work at Marjack early on December 17, 2020, walking out at 10.37 a.m. so she could go to the hospital to see her brother, who was taken there after an accident. By the time she arrived, he had already been discharged. Sometime that same day, her phone had been turned into her workplace after she had apparently lost it nearby. Before she was able to pick up her phone, she used a friend's phone to send a few texts. Summer's whereabouts between the 17th and the 20th are unclear, but she reportedly spoke to a relative at a convenience store around 8 p.m. on December 20th. This is the last time she was seen alive. Investigators used surveillance video to locate an area she had been seen walking with a person of interest, and they interviewed several witnesses. A search in late January of 2021, investigators discovered some of Summer's belongings, including a backpack. The search continued again near that area on February 4th, 2021, and they found additional items of hers near railroad tracks and power lines in a wooded area off Old Russellville Road in Jasper. This is where they would ultimately recover Summer's remains. In a press release on October of 2021, Sheriff Nick Smith shared that they had identified persons of interest and that his office thought they knew what happened but didn't have enough proof to make an arrest. He also announced that the sheriff's office was offering a $25,000 reward. Three years after her death, Summer's murder still goes unanswered, even with a person of interest and a likely theory of what occurred. If you have any information regarding the death of Summer Busby, you can contact Walker County Sheriff's Office at 205-302-6464. Or, if preferred, contact the Secrets True Crime Confidential Tip Line at 205-282-0740. Shondarius Tyus. According to family members, 24-year-old Shondarius Tyus was walking to his father's home in Selma, Alabama, and he seemed to vanish into thin air on his way. He was last seen near Highway 80 East and Choctaw Avenue. In 2021, Selma Police Chief Fulford told WSFA that foul play might be a possibility and that they had received several leads. However, as of this recording, three years later, Shondarius continues to be listed as an involuntary missing person in the ALEA database. Though there isn't much information available on his case, we did share his disappearance in episode nine. If you haven't had a chance yet, we suggest you go back and have a listen. Shondarius is a black male, about five foot eight and 200 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. He was last seen wearing a camouflage jumpsuit with a white t-shirt underneath. He has multiple tattoos on his arms, chest, legs, and head. Notably, the tattoo on the back of his head was a jester, and on one arm, the tattoo is of a full Bible verse. If you have any information on Sean Darius's disappearance, please contact Selma Police Department at 334-874-874. Two one two five. Joshua Gentry. In the afternoon on Christmas Day in 2018, Montgomery police and medics were called to the 4,000 block of Twin Lakes Drive. When they arrived, they located 34-year-old Joshua Gentry deceased. News articles were light on information, but they all stated that though the circumstances surrounding Joshua's death were not known, it was determined that he suffered a fatal gunshot wound to the head. As with so many cases, it's disappointing and sad, but this is all the information we could find at this time. If you have any information regarding the shooting homicide of Joshua Gentry, please contact Montgomery Police Department at 334-241-2651, Central Alabama Crime Stoppers at 833-251-7867, or submit an anonymous tip at the Central Alabama Crime Stoppers website. Christian Boyle. 18-year-old Christian Boyle of Bluntsville, Alabama, had been missing for two weeks when Blunt County Sheriff's Office received a tip on December 25, 2017, that his four-door silver Oldsmobile Alero may be on Cold Branch Road in Bluntsville. 
When BCSO responded, they found both Christian and his car, and it was soon determined to be a homicide. In the weeks prior to his disappearance, Christian had called his family regularly, checking on his ill father. When the call stopped coming and no one could reach Christian via phone or social media, his family knew something was wrong. According to CBS 42, officials stated two days prior to Christian's disappearance, he was with two men who were later charged with capital murder and robbery, something Christian had witnessed. Although BCSO identified two suspects, a male and a female, there was not enough evidence to make an arrest. In 2020, Blount County DA Pamela Casey reached out to the AG's office and asked them to look over the case, and they accepted. However, six years later, in just a few days of this recording, there has still not been any arrests related to Christian's death. Christian's is another case we covered on our Unforgotten podcast in episode four, and we hope you'll go back and listen. If you have any information related to the murder of Christian Boyle, please contact the Alabama Attorney General's Office at 866-419-1236, Blount County Sheriff's Office at 205-625-4127, or you can submit an anonymous tip on the Blount County Sheriff's Office website. Trenton James Way Trenton Way, a 27-year-old man from Dolomite, Alabama, was a store clerk at the Kangaroo Express near Highway 150 and Fairfax Avenue in Bessemer. Trenton went to work as usual on December 15th for his night shift. However, about 1.30 a.m. on December 16th during that shift, an unknown person entered the Kangaroo and robbed it of money and other unknown items. But this person also robbed Trenton of his life, shooting him before leaving the store. There was said to be an additional shot fired at the store from the outside when he left. Surveillance cameras caught some images, but none that could ID the suspect. There were some witnesses that were arriving to the store during the time of the robbery. However, they couldn't ID the suspect either. It is believed that they may have a second perpetrator that didn't enter the store as well, and the Bessemer police commented that one of the men may have been wearing a mask, but no further details were released. The suspect is described as a black male, approximately 5 foot 10 or less, with a medium build and was running towards Fairfax Avenue with a trash bag of money and merchandise. Even with the cameras and witnesses, eight years later, as of this recording, no arrests have been made in connection with this robbery turned murder. If you have any information about this robbery or the murder, please contact Bessemer Police Department at 205-425-2411, their anonymous tip line at 205-428-3541, Crime Stoppers at 205-254-7777, or submit an anonymous tip at the Crime Stoppers website. Jefferson Riles Chapman. 25-year-old Riles Chapman was last seen the evening of December 18, 2013, near the entrance of the Bocage subdivision where he and his parents lived. Riles' father, Wes, arrived home that evening to find another vehicle parked behind Riles' vehicle. Worried that one of Riles' old buddies had stopped by, Wes headed straight to the pool house to find that he couldn't enter. Instead of letting Wes in, Riles bolted from the house in his boxer shorts, leaving the rest of his belongings, including his wallet, money, keys, and cell phone, behind. Prior to his disappearance, Riles had been struggling with an addiction to prescription medications and had participated in rehab programs in an effort to fight that addiction. Wes and Jamie Chapman hoped Riles living in their pool house would be better for him. Authorities stated early on that the circumstances surrounding Chapman's disappearance make it different than other missing persons cases, but they didn't elaborate on what exactly was different. A fellow classmate had seen Rawls at Club La Vila in Panama City, Florida, and numerous people have claimed to have seen Rawls over the years. Those sightings have either been ruled out or unconfirmed. Multiple searches have been conducted over the last 10 years, but those searches were unsuccessful. Law enforcement have also conducted nearly two dozen polygraph tests on friends and family, but no leads were established. To learn more about the case, if you haven't listened already, Join us along with some of Ryle's family in Unforgotten's episode 20. If you know anything about the whereabouts of Ryle's Chapman or the events of December 18, 2013, please contact Dothan Police Department 
at 334-828-1072 or the Alabama SBI at 800-392-8011. Francisco Lopez Castillo 33-year-old Francisco Castillo was in his home on Selma Drive in Milledgeville in Baldwin County just two days after Christmas on December 27, 2013. He was going to meet up with his good friend and employer later that evening. Instead, as Francisco was opening his front door, a shotgun shell pierced his chest and he died almost instantly. There were two other people in the home that didn't witness the shooting, but due to a language barrier, neighbors ended up contacting the police after hearing the shot. Neither neighbor nor household members could give any witness accounts other than what they heard. Major Brad King of the Sheriff's Office has stated, even in the last year, that they have a suspect in mind and a theory about why this happened. They just need to provide that connection. Ten years have passed and there are still no arrests and no further evidence to corroborate the Sheriff's Office theory of what happened. This case is solvable with the right piece of information to fill in the puzzle. If you know anything, however small, please contact the Baldwin County Sheriff's Office at 251-937-0202 or at their website. Willie Reynolds 80-year-old Willie Clayton Reynolds of Matthews, Alabama, was last seen at approximately 8.30 p.m. by his daughter at his home on Athey Road in Montgomery County on December 19, 2012. December 21st, an Auburn Police Department employee stated they saw Willie and his truck along U.S. Highway 29 in Auburn. Law enforcement later received a tip that a Macon County resident claimed they picked Willie up the same day and gave him a ride to a grocery store near the intersection of U.S. Highway 29 and State Highway 80, where Willie then headed west on U.S. Highway 29. On December 24th, his white Ford Ranger was found abandoned at Exit 51 in Auburn, the same location he was first reportedly seen standing by his truck on the 21st. After locating the truck, Lee County, Auburn PD, Montgomery County, and state officials spent a week searching the woods near where they assumed Willie Reynolds went missing. Willie is a black male with gray hair, brown eyes, and requires glasses. He was last seen wearing blue jeans and a dark blue jacket. He was roughly 5'3 and about 165 pounds at the time he vanished. He has high blood pressure as well as a bone disorder called Paget's disease, which often causes misshapen and brittle bones that often result in fractures. Without his medications, this could cause him disorientation as well. If you know anything about Willie's disappearance 11 years ago, please contact Montgomery County Sheriff's Office at 334-832-4980, Central Alabama Crime Stoppers at 833-251-7867, or submit an anonymous tip at the Central Alabama Crime Stoppers website. Brenda Nell Deering The now 70-year-old Brenda Deering, who lived in Pennsylvania, was in Grand Bay visiting her family in December of 2004. On December 15th of 2004, Brenda, who was suffering from early-onset Alzheimer's disease, was last seen walking in the area of her daughter's residence in the 7,000 block of Crandall Road, about two miles from the Mississippi state line. Unfortunately, in 19 years, this is all that's known about her disappearance. Brenda has never been seen or heard from again. Brenda Deering is a black female with brown hair and brown eyes. She was approximately five foot seven and 285 pounds at the time she went missing. She was described as wearing an unspecified jacket, white capri pants and sneakers. She has pierced ears, and she could go by the last name of McCovery, but her nickname is Fudge. If you think you remember seeing Brenda or know anything at all about her disappearance, please contact the Mobile County Sheriff's Office at 251-635-7263, or you can submit an anonymous tip at their website. LaQuanta Nichelle Riley On the night of December 7, 2003, 19-year-old LaQuanta Riley left her aunt's Montgomery home with an unknown male in a four-door, dark green vehicle similar to a Ford Taurus or Chevy Caprice and went to her mother's home to pick up a jacket. LaQuanta's brother was there when she arrived around 11.30 p.m. and asked her who was in the vehicle because he didn't recognize it. LaQuanta said it was a friend she'd met in the neighborhood but gave no name. She then got back in the vehicle and hasn't been seen since. 
Prior to her disappearance, Laquanta had been living in Eufaula with a roommate, but had made the decision to move out over Thanksgiving holidays. When she returned to the apartment on December 5, 2003 to collect the rest of her belongings, there was a disagreement of some sort that left her upset. She called her mother, Pam Riley Bolden, and asked for a ride to Montgomery, but Pam was unable to pick her up at the time. After contacting other relatives, LaQuanta moved in with her aunt and cousin. Three days later, Pam reported LaQuanta missing. Pam reported receiving a disturbing message on her answering machine. While the message was difficult to decipher, Pam believed it was LaQuanta, distraught and crying, saying, leave me alone or let me go home. A male could be heard in the background saying LaQuanta's name before the call disconnected. Pam notified Montgomery Police Department of the message and stated two detectives made an audio recording of it. However, in 2014, then Montgomery Police Department detective Dante Gordon told AL.com he had heard of a voicemail but claimed it had never been provided to him. Detective Gordon also described LaQuanta's case as strange, stating they'd never received any real leads on her whereabouts and had no real cooperation from LaQuanta's acquaintances. Sometime later, investigators learned that LaQuanta's name had been used to rent an apartment in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Pam went to the complex and spoke to an individual who claimed LaQuanta had just recently moved out. He claimed LaQuanta had been in a fight and asked to borrow his phone. Twenty years later, as of this recording, LaQuanta's whereabouts remain unknown, and the investigation into her disappearance remains open. LaQuanta is a black female with black hair and brown eyes. She is approximately 5'8 and 200 pounds. She was said to be wearing a yellow and green Echo shirt, blue jeans, green and yellow Reeboks, a silver chain bracelet, and at the time had a tongue piercing. She also has a scar on her nose, a tattoo of Rest in Peace Misha on her left arm, and her name LaQuanta on her right arm. As of this date, she is now 39 years old. If you have any information on the disappearance or whereabouts of LaQuanta Riley, please contact the Montgomery Police Department at 334-625-2831, Central Alabama Crime Stoppers at 833-251-7867, or submit an anonymous tip at Central Alabama Crime Stoppers website. Stephen Horace Pearson The now 75-year-old Stephen Pearson was age 53 when he was last seen leaving his neighborhood on December 27th of 2000. Stephen was simply trying to help a confused postal worker and his out-of-town neighbor when he signed for what he thought was a package for the Bowmans that had been inadvertently delivered to his home in December of 2000 and dropped it off at their back porch until they returned. However, when James Bowman and his son returned, they informed Stephen that the package was not intended for them at all In fact, it actually was addressed to a home down the street, and Stephen had unknowingly delivered 10 to 15 pounds of marijuana. On December 27th of 2000, Stephen contacted the postmaster and reported what he'd been told, which triggered an investigation by the Mobile County Sheriff's Office. By the time MCSO began looking into the Bowmans, they had sold a lot of the marijuana that had landed on their doorstep. Stephen also left his daughter a voicemail that morning asking her to call someone for him. When his daughter was unable to reach him after multiple attempts, she reported Stephen missing on December 28th of 2000. Ten days after Stephen disappeared, his station wagon was discovered abandoned in a nearby wooded area. However, investigators feel the scene was staged. There were no fingerprints, even from Stephen, inside the vehicle, no blood, and no body. Items also seemed to have been placed so the vehicle could easily be identified and to make it appear as though someone had been camping nearby. The Bowmans are the only suspects to have been named publicly by the Mobile County Sheriff's Office. According to them, James Bowman Jr. has never cooperated. James Bowman III took a polygraph in 2009, but the results were inconclusive. 23 years later, Stephen is still listed as a missing person in the ALEA database. Stephen is a white male with gray hair and blue eyes. Stephen may also have a mustache or beard. He may wear eyeglasses. At the time he disappeared, he was 6 foot 1 and 165 pounds. Stephen also suffers from bipolar disorder and may require medical attention. 
If you have any information regarding the now 23-year-old disappearance of Stephen Pearson, please contact the Mobile County Sheriff's Office at 251-635-7263, or you can submit an anonymous tip at their website. Edward Consuegra. 36-year-old Edward Consuegra, a captain in the Air Force with 15 years of service, left his gunner annex office on December 3, 1992, and drove to his apartment for lunch, and never returned. At the time of his disappearance, Edward was employed as a procurement officer at the gunner annex of Maxwell Air Force Base. When the authorities checked his apartment, Edward's truck was still at his apartment, and none of his possessions appeared to be missing. On December 4th of 1992, the Air Force declared Edward AWOL. Montgomery Police Department requested the FBI to assist in the investigation, along with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. Shortly after his disappearance, the General Accounting Office issued a report alleging the Standard Systems Center at Gunner Annex had wasted millions of dollars by mismanaging computer purchases, something Gunner officials denied. Staff Sergeant Gary Quisenberry told the Atlanta Constitution that investigators did not suspect foul play, but that seemed inconsistent across the agencies. The Air Force had officially listed Edward as a deserter. The Montgomery Police Department considered Edward a missing person. And the FBI had listed Edward as a victim, kidnapping. Major Brent Smeltzer, a friend and former boss of Edward, told the Atlanta Constitution he thought Edward left to avoid a bitter divorce and large debt. Edward's family dismisses this theory, saying he would never have abandoned his parents or his children, and he was too close to retirement. They also added that none of his clothes were missing and his passport was still in his briefcase at work. Though he's listed in other missing persons databases, he is not listed in the Aaliyah database. If you have any knowledge of what may have occurred on December 3rd, 1992, or the whereabouts of Edward Consuegra, who would now be 67 years old, please contact the Montgomery Police Department at 334-241-2651, the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office at 334-832-4980, Central Alabama Crime Stoppers at 833-251-7867, or submit an anonymous tip at the Central Alabama Crime Stoppers website. Thank you for hanging out with us this year. We've felt privileged to share all of these cases though we wish there weren't so many to share. But at the least, we hope we have helped raise awareness for families whose cases that we have shared. And maybe, if only in a small way, we've helped bring even one case closer to being resolved. We wish you safe holidays and see you in 2024, everyone. Since Alabama Cold Case Advocacy's creation, we have dedicated innumerable hours to researching and networking in an effort to provide the largest platform we can to the cases we share. We shoulder all associated expenses with Alabama Cold Case Advocacy out of our own pocket, including the subscription fees for researching and production of the Unforgotten podcast to provide a cost-free avenue for the victims' families of those cases. We hope you will join in our efforts to raise awareness of Alabama's missing and murdered and support these families who have been forced to carry the immeasurable loss of their loved ones and the fight for answers. If you appreciate our mission and you are inspired to make a donation, your extra support will enable the ACCA to continue our research, share the cold cases, and help those families know that they are also unforgotten. Unforgotten is an Alabama cold case advocacy podcast recorded in conjunction with Riverside FM, hosted and distributed by Spotify for podcasters, available on your favorite podcast platform. Intro music for the show was created by Principles of Uncertainty, who also mixed and mastered this episode. Content and production is by Sellers and Stormy. Artwork by Sellers. Credits for music, sound clips, special mentions, and any source referenced in our podcast can be found in each episode's description. We hope you will join us on all the major social media sites and continue to raise awareness of our Alabama cold cases. Until next time, thank you for listening, and remember, justice may be delayed, but the victims and their families remain unforgotten.